Hi and welcome to Cherry Talks Movies. This one's going to be a bit different. I've just gone a bit wider in this particular video because I've been thinking about things which is always dangerous and always likely to lead me into a weird place but I was sitting down and watching a movie today which is not really unusual but I was checking out Blackula. I won't do a full review of Blackula because that's not what this video is about. This video is about me thinking about movies. Now, as you can see, I'm in a room surrounded by movies. There are times, maybe once a month, when I sit down in this room and I think, at the time I was a boy and until almost my adulthood, the idea of me owning a movie was impossible. Rich people could do it, rich people could buy prints of movies and have home cinemas and things like that. It wasn't at all democratic and it wasn't at all accessible to most people to own even a single movie in my lifetime that's changed it's become one of the great pleasures of my life to be able to own and enjoy movies which is why i filled this room with them the ability to own movies is under threat at the moment by the people who run movie studios I've been doing a little bit of a deep dive into the kinds of people who run the larger movie studios at the moment. They all tend to have MBAs. They all tend to think more as business people than movie people. They don't in any meaningful way care about cinema except as a means of making money. Silence of the Lamb. Has anyone ever seen a Silence of the Lamb? Which isn't to say that I expect movie makers to make the movies and whether they make money or not is not relevant. Of course it's relevant. The important thing to many movie makers over the last 130 years has been to make movies, to tell stories, to be a modern widespread equivalent of sitting around a campfire sharing tales. But that's no longer the case. In our time, the people running the largest movie studios in the world and the ones that are constantly buying up other movie studios and buying up other distribution companies and buying up the rights to various movies and all of that kind of stuff are people who who are basically ticket sellers as long as they get the money at the box office they don't care what they're showing they don't care what they're making they don't care what they're distributing it's only about the money and that's a threat to storytelling i dive back into the history of movies and for the first 10 or 15 years of movies and cinema as as a thing the people who ran things were creatives there were the lumiere brothers there was george melies there was max sennett there was chaplin who started out with max sennett and then moved off on his own there were companies like Famous Players Lasky. Even when Warner Brothers started, the Warners liked them telling stories. That tradition of theatre carried on in the new medium. It was about storytelling. It was about finding good stories to tell people. It was about finding the right people to direct them, the right people to star in them. The right way to excite and delight and make people cry and make them scared and make them delighted and make them laugh themselves sick all of that stuff mattered to the first generations of creative people making movies it still does matter to many many people making movies now but at a time around the 1910s we began to get gatekeepers we began to get people in between the creative people who delight in entertaining an audience and the audience at first we got movie studios run by people who didn't themselves make movies and we had a whole bunch of them turning up in the 10s and 20s and i've got a list here mgm water brothers disney disney started in 1923 paramount ufa in germany universal nordisk studio babelberg gormont british all of these distribution companies and movie making companies where the people who were running the movie studios were in their own selves creative except in their ability to find talent and find people to write the stories and tell the stories and direct and star and act and paint the sets all that kind of stuff we got to the stage of there being a first level of gatekeepers which was the movie studios and the people who greenlit films and then we got a second layer where churches and governments started getting in on the game and started having a say in what could be shown as a movie and what could be said in movies and, and what kind of stories could be told you know, governments and churches had an awareness of the power of cinema and the power of storytelling is a much wider thing 
to influence people and to entertain them and to steer their thoughts in certain directions. And they didn't like that. Churches didn't want people questioning the beliefs. Governments didn't want people thinking about alternate economic methods or alternate ways of living because that threatened their gigs. Of course, at the same time, governments were also thinking about the power of cinema as propaganda, and that had been going on since since the start of cinema itself, and the power of stirring up patriotism and stirring up hatred and stirring up a national will. So governments as gatekeepers had a double role. They didn't want people to believe certain things, but they definitely wanted them to believe others. And we still have that, but in a much subtler way to this very day. Governments influence even Marvel movies. The American government, and particularly the American military, had a big influence on the way that certain Marvel movies were told because Marvel wanted access to military technology for their movies. The American military said yes under certain circumstances. You couldn't tell certain kinds of stories. You couldn't put America in a bad light. Well, that kind of stuff, but I'm getting ahead here. And the other gatekeepers we had were people who owned cinemas. At first it was the movie studios, and then then the anti-monopoly laws in America broke up the movie studios and they had to sell off their theatres. But the people who owned and operated theatres then chose from among the available movies which movies they would show to an audience. And I've got a real awareness of this now, because I'm on a Facebook group which shows cinema ads from the 1950s and 1960s here in Australia, and in particular Sydney, where I grew up. And there are a lot of movies that are really ordinary films. The The movies that were shown in ordinary suburban cinemas and in the city cinemas, yes, there were some very big ones and there were some good ones, but all of the movies that ended up changing cinema were shown in little boutique cinemas, you know, 50, 100 seaters in the city or in some of the wealthiest suburbs. People in general didn't get access to Monolk, for instance, or they didn't get access to Fellini movies. They didn't get access to really good cinema in their artistic sense unless they went to small cinemas, which were often very far away from where most people lived. Yes, you could see a James Bond film or a Doris Day Rock Hudson comedy or you could see Lawrence of Arabia, or you could see a Cinerama movie in the Mayfair Cinema in Sydney. You could see all of those. Then, when you got to the suburban cinemas, the distribution companies would only make certain movies available to suburban cinemas. And very often, those movies were anywhere up to five or six years old. And they're the ones that people who could only get to their local cinemas watched. Of course, the distribution companies rented those out cheaper than they would a big blockbuster new film. So there was an economic reason for that. But suburban cinemas showed pretty ordinary stuff for a very, very long time. As I've looked in the newspaper ads I could find. As far back as the 1930s to the 1970s and 80s, the best movies weren't shown to the most people. They were gatekept for educated, posh people to see in these little boutique cinemas. And then in the 1970s, technology said, hold my beer. And suddenly we had VCRs, we had Betamax and we had VHS, and they were incredibly popular because there was a real passion for people, firstly, recording things so they could watch them later off the television, and not too far after that, owning copies of movies. There were companies here in Australia that started off that game. Companies like CEL started targeting special holidays, so they put out real macho movies just before Father's Day, and romantic comedies and musicals just before Mother's Day and family movies at Christmas. So they targeted specific holidays. And the public loved the idea of owning movies. You didn't have to go out of the house to go to the cinema. You didn't have to pay for the popcorn and the box of old gold chocolates. You could watch your movies at home. And people loved that. People loved the fact that there were fewer gatekeepers between them and the stuff that they wanted to watch. Before that, if you wanted to watch a movie you loved, you'd have to wait two to three years at times for it to come up on TV or for a cinema to show a copy of it again, assuming that they had the rights to it and there was an available physical copy of the movie in the country. So there was just that little bit less gatekeeping. Of course, there were gatekeepers. The video distribution companies chose the movies that they wanted to release. So there were still gatekeepers there. 
but they were just a, a little bit fewer purchasing vhs tapes and renting them as well being able to go to a, a blockbuster or a video easy or any of those places and selecting from hundreds if not thousands of films to see what you want when you want it and to see the kind of movie you want when you want it was a breakthrough for people it was a renaissance in interest in cinema which is why the 70s and 80s and 90s had so much really cool b and c grade cinema there was a hunger for new product there was a hunger for new movies and the people who ran video shops and ran video distribution companies knew what their audience wanted so they wanted basket case and they wanted other horror movies they wanted the emmanuel movies they wanted hardcore adult films as well there was a blossoming of interest in films you didn't have to worry about whether the movie was available for rent at your local video store on a saturday night when all the new movies went out really quickly and you'd see those little cards on the cases saying yeah, this video has been rented cable came along and cable had a limited range of movies available on it a little bit more than television but still not as much say as a video store and cable of course had gatekeepers as well movie companies owned cable companies and had the rights to certain things that didn't have rights to others and when there were two different cable companies in australia foxtel and Ostar, there would be a fight between them on who got the new big blockbuster movies to show only to their audience so there was a lot of gatekeeping there as well Ozstar went bust so foxtel became the only cable company here in australia and they won that war in the same way the bear just won the betamax war I mean, at one stage I, I did work for foxtel and we had people who were really interested in a movie showing on foxtel but it wasn't it was showing on Ozstar well they would call us up and complain because there were black stripes at the top and bottom of their tv screens because they had an old-fashioned tv and they didn't understand what a widescreen movie looked like on tv and i had endless arguments with people when i was working for fox so who just didn't understand a widescreen movie i digress and then we got physical media first we got laser discs which were clumsy and awkward and you had to flip them over and not everybody had access to them they weren't particularly popular here in australia and then we got dvd and dvd took off a lot because it was smaller than vhs and my vhs collection was really filling up my little flat at the time and i didn't mind shifting over to dvd because it was smaller and of course the quality was better you get the extras in it that weren't particularly easy to access even if they existed on a vhs tape and then we moved on to blu-ray and then we moved on to 4k and all of that stuff happened and in parallel with that streaming came on board and as the internet here in australia finally got out of the dial-up copper cable era which the conservative governments we had at the time really didn't want to do and it was only when the labor government came in that we had a national broadband network which looked at least partly into fiber optic cabling so when that stuff became popular streaming became popular but streaming now has hit a weird point where things are disappearing off streaming people have purchased things from streaming companies and then that company loses the rights to that movie and so things people pay to own copies of in a digital space are just gone and there are a number of people that are pissed off by that telstra our biggest telecommunications company had a telstra movies thing where they would allow people to purchase digital copies of movies they are ending that service in june so people who have paid hundreds if not thousands of dollars to own digital copies of their favorite movies are going to be sitting with absolutely zero with the rim removed once that service ends and so there's a growing groundswell of people who realize that streaming services are not their friends i've got three or four streaming services and i'm always aware that the moment you stop paying for it is when you have nothing they're like renting a house the moment you stop paying the rent you don't have a roof over your head and also the streaming services are dumbing down a lot of their product they're not putting out really fine films netflix is creating its own action films which are incredibly ordinary at times they are putting out some things which are, are good apple's putting out some interesting science fiction stuff for instance but for the most part the product on offer from a lot of 
streaming services is pretty middle of the road. There are exceptions. There are some interesting things coming out on Netflix and other services that are Korean mo- Korean movies and TV series and Chinese movies and TV series and Japanese movies and TV series. We're getting a bit more of that, which is okay, which is why I've still got Netflix. And then, of course, we've got the blue whale that is Disney. And Disney having bought up Marvel means that a lot of people can't access Marvel stuff unless they get Disney+. Plus. People who are fans of Doctor Who here in Australia can't watch Doctor Who unless they have Disney+, Plus, which a lot of Doctor Who fans I know are really pissed off about. And Disney, of course, has decided not to produce physical media available in the Australian market anymore. So Blu-rays and DVDs and 4Ks, you have to go overseas to get them, which, of course, means paying more money and paying exchange rates and things like that. There's also talk of physical media dying with the large companies just not being bothered anymore. And so we're getting back to that stage, and which is the whole point of this video, where if physical media goes, we've got a lot more gatekeepers, we've got a lot of blockers in seeing the stuff that we want to see. Here in Australia, if you want to see, the, say, the Criterion channel, you have to get a VPN, which slows down your connection and can mean buffering at times. And, of course, you have to pay for the Criterion channel, and you've got to pay for your VPN. So there are all these gatekeepers trying to stop us from watching the things we want to watch. Now, there is a resurgence in interest in physical media. There's been a lot of press here in Australia about it, where pissed off people are telling the world, we don't want this. We want to be able to own a copy of the movie. We're willing to pay a company for them to sell us a copy of the movie for our personal use so that we can own and enjoy it and even lend it to friends, which, of course, with streaming services is not possible. And when it was illicitly possible, they eventually blocked people from doing that. So what's the future? I don't know. I can't even imagine how the minds of the MBAs who run movie studios work and I don't particularly want to but I can kind of predict a couple of things first off if physical media is stopped by the people gatekeeping a lot of the things independent physical media will still exist companies like imprint and umbrella who are putting out premium product will continue they will get the rights wherever they can to show something interesting to an audience their business model says we like the quirky stuff we like the unusual stuff we will find a way to get that to an audience so physical media isn't entirely going to die there's a great interest in it particularly at the top end of the thing where there is a premium to it where there are a lot of extras where you get a booklet and some lobby cards and things like that all of that stuff for the foreseeable future is going to continue it's going to be the tempo movies that you're not going to have available here in Australia. That, of course, then leads to what the movie studios don't want, which is piracy. It's dead easy to pirate any movie. If it's illegal in your country, there'll be a way to do it. If you've got a cousin going overseas, get them to put it on an SD card for you. There are immensely easy and accessible ways of avoiding non-piracy measures. But people want to pay for what they own. Most people aren't naturally larcenous. They would rather pay for something they see as valuable. And because of the way we are as animals, physical media, something you can touch and hold and turn over in your hand, has a greater perceived value than a digital copy of something. We like to own things we can touch. And that's a powerful force in the way human brains work. So I should probably wind this up with simply saying, I'm glad I can own copies of movies at this moment in time. Even if I do have to pay more to get a copy of poor things. Because I really want that movie. And I really want a physical copy of that movie. And I know that five years from now it's going to be almost impossible to find on a streaming service. Because that's the nature of streaming services. So having a copy of it on my shelf. I go, oh yeah, I really like that movie. Maybe I should do a Yorgos Lathamos film festival in the house. So I've got a copy of Poor Things and I can watch it. That kind of stuff has immense value to me and it's worth me paying the premium, even though I do it reluctantly. The other side of things, and I'll, before I finish, I'll just mention the other side of things. I realise that people aren't all fortunate enough to have the spare money to buy physical copies of movies. And some of the people who do don't have a lot of storage space. So getting a collection and keeping a collection like this is a privilege. 
and I constantly remind myself of that privilege and I constantly remind myself that not everybody who watches my channel has that privilege I am keenly aware of that I'll share the love of movies but I, I try not to brag about how many I have and the ones that I have I will show to people because I think they're movies people should watch and that they will probably like but I've also got to balance that with an awareness of my privilege which is why one of the things I like doing on the channel is a hauls from op shops and thrift stores where people can get a decent movie cheaply by getting it second hand I like that part of it I like the egalitarianism of that kind of approach to owning movies where you can find a decent copy of something even if it's on DVD and it's just come out on Blu-ray or even if it's on Blu-ray and it's just come out on 4k people get rid of the previous iterations of their media so that they can have the biggest and latest and that then advantages people who go to thrift stores and secondhand stores and op shops and pawn brokers they can get a copy of a movie relatively cheaply and the fact that many many people do just emphasizes that pleasure we have in owning copies of movies that we love and being able to watch them at a moment's notice even if your internet's down or even if unfortunately you are at the stage where you've had to cancel your internet service because you can't afford to you can still afford electricity you've still got a player and you've got a disc so whatever the future brings physical media will exist in a number of different forms so don't buy into the scare campaigns that a lot of people are selling for clicks physical media will exist because people have a passion for it and particularly people like me who remember a time when you couldn't own physical media the magic of being able to reach up on a shelf and grab a movie and watch it without any gatekeeper at all beside whoever runs your electricity company that for me is still magical and i hope i never lose the sense of wonder i have about owning a copy of a movie and being able to watch it whenever i like and also being able to share that with somebody watching a movie with my nephew billy is a great pleasure for me watching a movie with middle-aged geek girl that she hasn't seen that maybe i have or maybe i haven't is a pleasure sitting around that campfire telling stories or having stories told to us is wired hard into the human brain and the human heart the fewer gatekeepers there are between the storyteller and the audience the better that story is so that's it for this time around bit of a philosophical ramble i hope you enjoyed this video if you did let me know leave a comment tell me what you think about this kind of content you can also hit the like button and hit the notification bell and subscribe to the channel you can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash cherry talks movies or becoming a channel member next up i've got something fun for the middle of the week video because this one's a little bit heavy until then watch some good movies watch some bad movies watch blackula it's a hell of a lot of fun and i'll catch you next time